that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 1 to 3. Once again, a very good morning and welcome to the first Sunday service of the Pasir Panjang Church of Christ. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with me, my name is John. I'm the Youth Worship and Media Minister here at this church, and I promise that I am not dressed like this every single Sunday. It's something that our youth get to do together. Best Dress Sunday is the first Sunday of the year, and it's wonderful to celebrate it with this family of God that meets here. We are in, as Kyle mentioned, a year-long journey, and that Irvin showed during the end of Bible class earlier, that we are on this journey of discerning the values of God and learning what it means to be a people who are image makers and who are table spreaders, a people who are compassionate and restorative, a people who are missional and revelational. And that's something we're going to unpack in our Bible classes, our sermons, and all of our ministry groups in 2024. And our hope is that this will empower us to return to our building at 347 as a new people. As we grow in numbers, let's celebrate that, as we grow in the number of ministry groups and the ideas that we have for, you know, I think that this will go to the blessing of our community and our people. We celebrate that. But the thing we are most excited about as we become a new people is that we become more and more like Jesus. How are we looking more like Him? How are we talking more like Him? How are we acting more like Emmanuel, God with us? When people look at us, will they feel as if, huh, I'm not just interacting with a normal human being, but with one who is anointed with the Spirit of God? Wouldn't that be a wonderful kind of people to become. And as Kyle mentioned in our last series, we were talking about what it means for Jesus to be the image of God, the image of God into which we are transformed. Because as we look to Him, as we set our gaze upon Him who is the image of the invisible God, we become that image ourselves. Or rather, the image of God that we were created with is restored, is renewed. And then we go out and help others to become images of God as well, to restore their God-given image. And that is what it means to be an image-making people. Today, we begin talking about our second value, revelational. And as my good friend Caitlin Tan once reminded me, it's a big word, revelational. It's five syllables long. It is not the kind of word we will use on a day-to-day -day kind of basis. But it's one of those big words that is an important big word because it describes our very big God. We believe that the Bible tells the story of a God who is, in his essence, revelational. He is not a God who hides away behind a big cloud somewhere in the sky and then tests humans, hey, are you smart enough to find me or not? Okay, no, that's not the God of the Christian Bible. Our God is one who is constantly showing himself, constantly revealing himself to his people. A God who allows himself to be seen with human eyes, touched with human hands, heard with human ears, manifest to our human capacities. And now some people don't like this kind of God. Some people think that we're insulting him by making him too human. They feel like it's offensive to say, how can a holy and infinite God become mixed with our dirty, limited humanity. These people want to protect God's holiness by keeping Him far up there in the sky, far from our human weakness. But the truth of the Christian gospel is that God doesn't need us to protect Him from the human condition. No. He willingly 
joins himself to our human condition. He reveals the Godhead in our humanity so that we might become united with his divinity. God enters into our human condition so that we can enter into his holy condition. And as we will see in this series, the way that God does this showing up, the way he does this revealing and revel revelating to us who he is, is not what we will always expect. Today we begin by looking at Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. And if you want to turn there with me or tap there with me, you're welcome to. This will be our text that we're exploring today as we begin to meditate on how God reveals himself. The word of the Lord. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king saw this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let us pray. O God, who art great and worthy of praise, we behold you as a child, an infant, a baby, in lowly, forsaken Bethlehem, considered often as the least among the nations. And yet, it was there that our Saviour was born, a baby with nothing spectacular about him. Help us behold him. Help us open our eyes to see that contained in this fragile human body is the Messiah himself, the Son of God, the one anointed with power from above and by the Holy Spirit to change the world and to change us. Give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, and help our hands be able to touch the presence of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen. The story begins by introducing us to this group of people called the wise men. My translation is ESV. It says wise men. Some of your translations might have this word, M-A-G-I. I was asking around earlier, how do you pronounce that word? So I heard the uh, M-A-G-I may be pronounced Maggie, like Maggie me, Maggie noodles. Very nice, by the way. And, but basically, these people, the Greek word, I like to pronounce it Magi. Sounds less easily confused with Maggie noodles. The, ma the Magi, these are, this word is a Greek word referring to a group of elite Persians who are essentially like the priests of their community. They're the spiritual leaders from out east, east of, uh, of Jerusalem and Judea. Most depictions will show that there are three magi. When you see the nativity scenes, there are these three gentlemen dressed in elaborate robes. Although, actually, Scripture doesn't say if there are three of them. We only think that, we only say that there are three because they offered the Lord Jesus three gifts later in the story. So basically, they are the spiritual leaders of their community, right? And they are trained in dream interpretation and astronomy by their standards. You can think of the equivalent being 
people like Joseph in the book of Genesis or Daniel in the book of Daniel. These are the kind of people they are, very highly regarded by their community, by their society. And so some translations call them even kings or uh, these very wealthy gentlemen. They're not kings as far as we can tell, but they are people very highly regarded. And so they claim to have seen the star of the king of the Jews and they conclude that, okay, we should go find this guy. Seems like a big deal, right? Scholars have tried to pinpoint, you know, what star was this 2,000 years ago? Was it a planet alignment? Now? Was it a, a supernova that went off? Was it, uh, was it a comet that flew by the earth at that time? What it was is not very known, and that's kind of beside the point. The point is that they saw something that signaled the world is about to change and you need to go and attend to the person who is about to cause this change in the world. So, naturally, they know, okay, the king of the Jews is born, so let's go look in the most likely place he will be born. They go to Jerusalem, right? The capital city of the Jews, the place of power and prestige. And we know from historical records that King Herod had built a very opulent, majestic palace in Jerusalem, as well as a temple that was very ornate, very beautiful, and by many standards, even better than the Temple of Solomon. And so these magi, they come to King Herod and they tell him their mission and he's terrified, he's troubled, and the whole city trembles along with him. Uh, we don't have time to explore Herod's story specifically, even though it's fascinating, but basically he is the sitting king in Judah. He is technically the king of the Jews because the Romans put him there. Now here come these fellows and they tell him, where's the new king of the Jews, huh? He would understandably be very scared because he has been living in this fear that one day he's going to get replaced, that one day a true descendant of David will rise up and usurp him and take back the, king, the kingship that is rightfully his. So Herod is afraid, understandably. So Herod needs answers and he calls together the scribes and the chief priests, which is a general phrase used to describe Basically, the equivalent of the Magi. The Magi who are spiritual leaders from the East, these guys are spiritual leaders of the Jewish people, obviously, right? And this is the group I want to spend a bit more time on. Whereas the Magi interpret the stars, the scribes and the chief priests interpret and read the scriptures. And as it turns out, they do manage to find the answer. They can pinpoint exactly where the Messiah will be born. And in their excitement, they scoot off to Bethlehem along with the Magi to find their Messiah. Except, that's not what happens. Only, as far as we can tell, only the Magi actually leave Jerusalem to find this king of the Jews. There's no mention that any Jewish scribe or priest in that party went along with them. And I want to pause here and just ask, why? Isn't that odd? For any of us, if you get a notification that your Shopee delivery has arrived at the collection point, you will make arrangements to go and collect it, right? You will go out of your way to get what you are waiting for. But not these people. When their king is born, the Messiah, the one prophesied for hundreds of years has come and they're not doing anything about it. Matthew, in his gospel, doesn't address this particular problem just kind of moves on with the story. But by reading the rest of the Gospels, we do get some idea. Because one of the big ideas in the Gospels is that Jesus does not meet people's expectations. In fact, he takes their expectations of what it means to be the Messiah, the Son of God, and he turns them upside down. And as a result, many people are let down. They're disappointed by Jesus. They are expecting a powerful military general who will overthrow the Romans and restore the kingdom of Israel to its former glory. They're expecting a religious leader who will throw out the pagans from their holy land and reinstall proper temple worship according to the law of Moses. They're expecting someone with a good background, with a good upbringing, with all the resources and training they need to become the next leader of Israel because that's what the Messiah is supposed to be, right? Jesus does none of that. He doesn't throw out the Romans, but he tells people, hey, 
When there's a Roman soldier who comes and asks you to carry his heavy luggage for him, yes, you the 80-year-old man, carry it not for one mile, but for two miles. If they abuse you, turn the other cheek. Oh, there's this Roman centurion coming to me. The enemy and his servant is sick. I'm going to heal him. Helping the enemy? Jesus doesn't tell people to restore temple worship according to the law of Moses. In fact, John chapter 4, he says, not on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship God, but God is spirit and in truth. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That's not in the law of Moses. At least not apparently. And instead of being from a good background, he's from this backwater village. He is born to a blue-collar worker and a teenage girl out of wedlock. It seems that even from his birth, Jesus is not meeting people's expectations. And it starts even from his birthplace, this place called Bethlehem. Suppose that we heard in the news that the next Prime Minister of Singapore is going to be someone who didn't finish primary school, never did PSLE because he flunked out and never continued. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to vote that guy, right? Suppose that you are about to get some kind of surgery and you learn that your doctor graduated at the bottom of his class. Uh, can I get another referral, right? Or suppose I told you that next Sunday's preacher was baptized only last Tuesday. Uh, probably not, right? I'll just watch online or something like that, right? When any of these situations happen, we're thinking, no, that's ridiculous. They are not qualified to do this important job. There is no way that they can do the job and do it justice to the standard that it needs to be done. And that, I think, is how the scribes and Pharisees and the chief priests must have felt when they hear that the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem? There is no way that someone born in that dinky, good-for-nothing village can ever become the king of the Jews because Bethlehem, as far as we can tell, really didn't have anything. It was just a little village. Bethlehem is to, Ju it, Bethlehem is to Judea what Chua Chukang is to Singapore. There's nothing there. The only reason it's there is to be next to Tengah, where everything else is going to be. I, I can say this, by the way, because my family lives there. So no offense to Chua Chukang and people who live there. Although if you are living there, you probably agree with me. So the, chief, so the scribes and the chief priests, despite knowing exactly where the Messiah is going to be born, despite knowing their Bibles very well, memorizing most of it, they decide that it's not worth the effort to make the journey. But the Magi do go, and their experience is worlds apart when they see the star that guides them to Bethlehem, Scripture describes them as exceedingly joyful with great joy. It's a strange expression that basically is like, the word exceedingly joyful is not enough to contain their joy. One scholar even says, this is closer to the, when we say deliriously happy. They're just out of their minds celebrating and rejoicing. We found him. We found the Messiah. We found the King of the Jews. And then they come to humble Bethlehem and they enter this humble dwelling and they see this teenage girl with an infant son, a baby, and they fall down and worship. This is not a palace, by the way. Whether we think that this was still when they were in the manger or when they had moved out from to uh, another house post-birth, this is not the most kingly scene to find a newborn king of the Jews. They lavish him with gifts, and some have even attributed name, uh, meanings to each of these gifts. And what has this baby infant done? Nothing that would normally be expected of a king. He has no army. He hasn't read a word of scripture. He can't even talk. In fact, he's probably done nothing but to cry, drink his mother's milk, maybe burp after a good meal, and then go back to sleep. He has no army, no servants attending to his royalty. His baby clothes are probably still stained with the animal feed in that feeding tray that he was originally put in. King of the Jews. And yet, herein lies the wondrous mystery. 
of all the forms that God could have taken to come into the world and he could have taken any form he wanted, he does not come as a king or a general or a scholar or a priest or a wealthy nobleman. The Almighty God reveals himself in an innocent, vulnerable, helpless baby. Have you ever thought that Jesus needed several months before he could roll over? Have you ever thought that Jesus needed several months and much coaxing before he could say Abba? Have you ever thought of Jesus, baby Jesus, you know, sucking on his thumb and Mary and Joseph being like, Oi, Jesus, don't, don't, don't chew that. Have you ever thought of that? Some might say that this is too humiliating for God. They cannot imagine that God would ever have to go through puberty, for example. They cannot imagine that Jesus would have body odor after sweating it out in Joseph's carpenter's workshop. Because that seems insulting. That seems repulsive. It seems too ordinary, too lowly. We feel this need to defend the divinity of God. So we say, okay, yes, fine. Jesus was fully human. He was fully divine. But even his humanity was special. It's not like our humanity. No, no, no. Jesus is special. Jesus is like, you know, he's, he's, he's much better than me. I can never be like that kind of humanity. But that's not how scripture seems to describe Jesus. All through the New Testament, we are told of a Jesus who became like one of us, who emptied himself of everything and didn't just become like one of us, he became the very lowest of us. Going through all that we humans have ever experienced and all that we will ever experience, that is the wondrous mystery of the Christian gospel. God reveals himself in the ordinary. And here's the question then. Do we believe that this is still true today? Do we believe that God can and does still work in ordinary ways? Do we believe that God can and does show up in ordinary people and circumstances, even those who are most helpless, most vulnerable, most weak? During my final year in university, I was working on a thesis exploring what Singaporean Christianity is like. And one of my findings is that Singaporean Christians are generally not in the innocent, vulnerable, and helpless group. We are very well off. And we, uh, the vast majority of Singapore Christians, some of whom are sitting here today, are very influential in private, public, and non-profit sectors. And that's a good thing. Let's celebrate that. That should make us, in fact, the most thankful, the most gracious, the most benevolent people in the world. But here then is our challenge. We must never forget that Christianity began and still is the faith of the weak and the helpless. It is the faith of those who find themselves at the lowest point of, of life and the rest of society looks down upon them. It is a faith that belongs to those who feel like they're not good enough, not even good enough to, they, where they feel ashamed to step into a church. The Christian faith belongs to such as these. These are the people in whom God is revealed. As our Lord Jesus himself declared in his most famous sermon, the kingdom of heaven belongs not to the rich and powerful, but to the poor in spirit, to those who mourn, to those who are not able to stand up for their own rights because of their meek and humble situation, to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. To such does the kingdom of heaven belong. In the TV series, The Chosen, there's a scene where Jesus is speaking the Beatitudes, this passage, he's blessed are the poor in spirit all the way to blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you falsely for my sake. And one of his disciples in that scene asks him, why? Why, Jesus? Why these people? I love the way that the actor responds. If you want to find me, look for these people. How profound. God is found in those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Not because that's great. It's not like, oh, you're poor in spirit. How wonderful. Oh, you, you're abusing. You can't stand up for your own rights. How wonderful. No. These people are blessed because these are the people with whom God draws near to. These are the people 
who have Jesus in them and through whom he is revealed. Jesus is found not in kings sitting in glorious palaces or he's not found in the, in the general who leads a big, vast army. He's not found in billionaires with their lavish mansions or even in religious people who claim to have followed all the rules perfectly, who show up to church every Sunday and always do their quiet time. Jesus is found and God is revealed in the babies of the world, in those who are most innocent, most humble, most vulnerable, most helpless. And we have a choice. We can choose to respond like the scribes and the Pharisees, the chief priests, to dismiss such people altogether because, nah, there's no way, you, there's no way that God can ever like you. Or we can choose to respond like the Magi upon beholding the glory of God in a baby fall down in reference, in adoration, and in worship. So brothers and sisters, let us open our eyes to behold the wondrous mystery of God in those who are most innocent and vulnerable and helpless. For he is not far away. He is near to the brokenhearted. God is revealed in the tired parent of young children. Those who are always wondering if everything you're doing is enough, whether you're doing enough and the right things to prepare your children to enter a dangerous new world that's constantly changing. To you who are stressed out in raising the next generation, God is revealed in you. God is revealed in those who lie in hospital beds, sickly, alone, with tubes in every part of their body. God is revealed in those who are estranged from family and rejected by friends. God is revealed in those who are unmotivated despite having all this pressure around them to do well, whether you're a student and you have 10 tuition classes and you just can't find the motivation to work hard at it. If you are a working adult feeling burnt out or already burned out by the work because the daily grind holds no more meaning for you, God is found in there as well. God is revealed in those who doubt, who don't have everything figured out yet because true faith is not the absence of questions and doubt. True faith is the courage to ask, to question, and even complain because you know that somewhere in the palm of God's hands lies the true answer that we've always been waiting for. So the next time that you are feeling lonely, vulnerable, helpless, like there's nothing you can do about your situation. Remember this, God has not abandoned you. But it is precisely in that moment that he draws nearest to us. The next time you feel far from Sunday, caught up in your daily routine, and you think to yourself, where on earth is God? Like uh, Irving was pointing out this morning, when you're changing a diaper and you're asking, where on earth is God in this situation? Open your eyes to behold God there in the ordinary rhythms of this life. And the reason why we can say this so confidently, the reason why we can enter into broken situations and say, no, God is still here, the reason is this. It's not because God has pity and from on high zaps you with power and changes the situation in an instant. It's because He became just such a person. God is revealed in the people who are broken and weary and lonely because he came as one who would offer his body to be broken, to face utter isolation and loneliness, to be rejected by even his closest followers and have to give his own mother away to someone else. God is found in all of these people, in all of us who feel hurting and broken and helpless because so was Jesus, the all-powerful God who became born as a helpless baby and would grow up to become a helpless criminal on a cruel cross. Herein lies the wondrous mystery. And here's the amazing thing. We don't despise such a man. We worship him as God. And he would not despise or reject any of us who feel lonely and vulnerable, far from it. He comes to live in us. He comes to share his love, his power, 
his compassion, his grace with those of us who are most lowly. And if we let him, if we open our eyes to see him revealed in the ordinary, may he also be revealed in us. Come behold 